Today's reading is from uh, 2 Timothy, starting at chapter 4, verse 1 to 8. You'll find that on page 1056. Fulfill your ministry. I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Rebuke, correct, and encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, will multiply teachings for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, exercise self-control in everything, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure is close. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day and on, not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. This is God's word. We're going to uh, focus on the verses 6 to 8 together this evening. And before we do that, let's simply ask the Lord to guide us in our hearts as we hear his word and spend some time in it. Let's just pray. Father, again, we thank you for guiding us again tonight, but also, Father, we ask you specifically now that you would open our hearts, our thinking, our desires, our, our love and our emotions, everything about us to your word. Father, that we may hear it, see it, grasp it by the blessing of your spirit upon our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. So as uh, we're approaching our verses in this, uh, that, uh, that we've got before us here tonight, there's a danger that we might do something like create a balance sheet. We're going to have a look at what it is to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and we might create a bit of a balance sheet in the process. We might set up a list of pros and a list of cons about how, uh, you know, about being a Christian. Uh, we might set down the things on one side that will say, this is the benefit of being a Christian. These are the things that we will gain from. And then we put down another list and say, well, these are the negatives about being a Christian and these are the things that are going to impact badly upon us if we're a Christian. And at the end of that, doing that, we weigh it all up and we try to see whether the transaction is worth it. We do that with a lot of things in life these days and we can do that with our verses that we've got before us tonight as well. I've actually seen people do this. I heard, I've heard evangelist type messages that do that and one man that I saw recently began his exposition of these particular verses that we've got, the verses 6 to 8, uh, uh, by saying in effect that following the narrow winding path by saying to us the path of the Christian life with all of its difficulties and trials he said at the end of it, you'll find that it's worth it. Well, there's absolutely no doubt at all that it's worth it. Following Jesus wherever he leads will end in blessing and joys of such grandeur and wonder that we cannot even comprehend them right now. That's God's fixed purpose and promise in the Lord Jesus Christ to all those whom he calls what it is not, however, is a payoff at the end of the path that we have struggled through and we've worked so hard to achieve. Following Christ wherever he leads is the privilege and the desire of all those who have been called and received the blessing of the second birth into him by the might and the grace and the love of God in Christ Jesus alone. Nothing extras. 
And that continues to grow until it is fully realised in glory. It is never, ever earned. Now, it's all of it, grace and mercy from God. Have a look at our verses. Paul is saying, verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. By the way, you're going to hear a little bit of a difference in what I'm reading here because I just suddenly realised I sat there and Errol was reading my Bible and his are different. Um, And probably my Bible and yours is different. I'm reading from the ESV. So if it sounds a bit different, just bear with me. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. You'll be able to follow it. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have lost, who have loved, I should say, his appearing. Paul has hung in there. That's what he's saying. He's ready to step over into the final fulfilment of God's gifts of grace and you get the sense he's had enough. enough. He's so ready. Let it come is kind of what he's saying. Now Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, the second letter to Timothy, we believe at around about the year of our Lord, 68. We believe he was in what was known as the Mamertine Prison. I believe uh, tourists can still visit this place today in Rome. Now, prisons are bad places. I've visited people in prison. The facilities are pretty good in a basic sort of a way. But you wouldn't want to live there. You wouldn't want to certainly not live in that particular kind of culture. But by the standards of what Paul was in, the prisons today are kind of five-star motels in comparison. They really are. Paul was in a circular type of prison, very low ceiling. Um, You know, the floors were stone, the walls were stone, uh, the the ceiling was stone as well. The prisoners were let down through a hole in the ceiling and the roof into the ground. It was dug into the ground. Uh, and, and there was no natural light in that place. There, was no, there were no sanitary facilities at all. There was no running water, no air, well, no air conditioning in the summertime and no heating in the wintertime, nothing but the groans of the dying, the complaints of the living and vermin and filth all over the floor. Now, that's the prison Paul is in. And here's the old Apostle Paul. He's an old man here. He's close to the end of his ministry. He's looking back. He's taking inventory inventory of things. And then he kind of looks forward as well. And he's anticipating what's going to come. And you don't get from his inventory of his life is him saying, oh man, my youth was pretty messed up. Uh, maturity was a struggle for me. Old age, oh man, I regret that. <laughs> it's like, oh no, you, know, you don't get that from Paul. Even though he's in prison, this horrible place, this hole in the ground, as he wrote this letter, crowded with other people, there's these fresh breaths of heaven blowing through everything that he writes here. He was in prison holding a fa- for holding a faith and love for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's about to be put to death. His time was running out. There is no defeat, however, no depression in him. Now, I I was trying to think this through. Maybe if we were gathered together this evening for the Apostle Paul's funeral. Just try to imagine it. We've been called together. The Apostle Paul has died. We're here to uh, mark his funeral. He's written his last letter, this Timothy, to Timothy, Timothy's received his letter, he's read it and read it and I imagine him devouring it over and over again and then sharing it with us here, his fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord but then what everyone had been expecting was going to happen had taken place. The Apostle Paul has died. And here we are, we're gathered in, together in worship 
of the Lord for his funeral. What would we say? Now, I don't know if Timothy would have led the small graveside service or whether they would have gathered in someone's home, but we've come together to pray and to sing and meditate on the word of God and to talk about Paul. And what sort of things would we say to each other about the Apostle Paul? We could call him great. I think we might do that. He was a mighty man. Probably short, but a mighty man. He had a very big character. A great saint. A sinner saved by God's blessed grace, wonderfully gifted and deeply passionate for the spread of the gospel, for people to come to saving faith, and yet that would be the last thing that he himself would have wanted to hear. In fact, I can kind of hear Paul saying to us, only the Lord is great. In another congregation, there was a Welshman where I served and he would every Sunday deliberately ask people, how are you? What do you say? Oh, I'm good, thanks. Every Sunday, nobody's good. We're all sinners. Are you well? Same thing here. Paul would say, I'm not great, only the Lord is great. Maybe we could call Paul our father. You know, he never married, so he had no children to call him father, and yet we could say that he was a father in the faith to a great many men and women and children. Maybe we could call him pastor. If there's anything we can call him and think of, like we, that's how we, I'd, I'd think of him, he's a pastor. Because God laid on him the call to bring the word of God in season, out of season, with compassion and love to everyone that he possibly could. But you know, like the funeral of any one of God's people, it is such a waste of the heart of the man and of the glory to God if we were to spend our time only thinking about him. We need to go where Paul always wants pe wanted people to go. Go to Jesus. We sat at the table. One of the little things that we say at the table is look up to Jesus, see him. Well, that's Paul. Look to Jesus. Think about Jesus. Spend your thinking about him. We need to go there. Think about God and only about him. That was his, his all-consuming message wherever he went because it's only by thinking about the Lord, the God, the Almighty that we're going to be growing in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we will see where the strength and the life and the love of the man, the Apostle Paul, of the Lord Jesus Christ lay. So we've seen how Paul in this letter and in these verses before us now was at urgent pains to, to stress certain crucial and vital fundamental things to young Timothy. Paul could see his life coming to an end. What we see here is what can be seen in all whose lives have been lived to the blessed, in the blessing of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And in a few very simple words, the, Paul, the Apostle Paul reveals Christian triumph and Christian assurance. Triumph and assurance, words which irresistibly cause all of us who, who read those sort of words with the eye of faith to look up to the Lord Jesus, the righteous judge, and with longing desire to see him come and to crown with glory. So perhaps at a funeral like the Apostle Paul, we would pray, Lord God, give us a life and a death like this so that we will see Jesus more. Now, I've taken out a bit of time out of this because the very first thing, I want to, now comes the first point, by the way, if you're wondering. Here's the first point. He's looking back in review. Verse 7, he looks back, he says, I have fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. 
and he's telling us that he's fought like a spiritual soldier. He tells us earlier in chapter 2, verse 3, he says, I share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ, of Christ Jesus. And when God saved Paul, he, he didn't invite Paul to uh, give him a, a life of comfort. He, he, he invited him to a fight. He didn't invite him to a cushion. He invited him to a cross. And Paul knew what it was to, to fight and to endure hardship. And in his own summary of his own life in 2 Corinthians, he says in chapter 11, verses 23 to 28, he labours in imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day... I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Paul could actually say, I have fought the good fight. You know, he wasn't like some Christians today. One worship service per week, oh, that's almost too much to manage. I love it that you're here tonight. It's wonderful. Bible study, prayer meeting during the week, <laughs> that's hard. Paul knew what it was to pray and to pay the price to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there are some people who call themselves Christians. No one else probably would. But everyone would be too afraid to say anything to those people. But there are Reformed people and there are Baptist people and there are Presbyterians who all want the benefits of the Christian faith but they're not willing to fight for it. They want to be comfortable on the wrong side, in the church but not of the church. They don't want to put out any sweat, no blood, no tears. They may complain if the church isn't growing, but if it depended on them, it wouldn't grow at all. Their life is about resting in Jesus and they've fallen asleep. They're just snoring their way into hell because they're not actually doing anything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And people today, you know, we've all heard this, people complain that the youth of today in Australia just sort of hold out their hand expecting to get everything for no effort whatsoever. But often there are people in the church who complain loudest about that and are also the same people who don't understand that we are to be spiritual warriors. Paul said, I have fought the good fight. He could see death was coming, he's a realist, but God the Lord granted him the faith that whatever life on this earth could still inflict on him, he was ready and already had suffered a great deal, but he was still ready. Whatever was still to come on him, the Lord was with him. And then you go into other parts of Scripture, the New Testament, you see that Paul speaks of the, the passing of a believer in Christ and as a departure to be with Christ. You know, to be home with the Lord. He speaks of leaving this world as something that's gained, something way far better than falling asleep in Jesus. And that is actually the teaching of the Bible right throughout, from Genesis to Revelation. The Christian is someone who has come to know himself as a sinner, found himself standing outside of the camp and the family of God just because he's a sinner. Well, just because, it's not just, is it? But the Christian is also someone who's heard and received by faith this offer of Christ's forgiveness and the recreating grace and the saving work of the Son of God and, and Jesus has come into your life and you, you have been so gra grafted into the family of God. And in his strength and in his power alone, you go on, as Paul puts it in our verse here, to fight the good fight, to run the race, to keep the faith. And when our verses here speak of fighting the good fight, we need to understand that this is the language of faith. The fight isn't in the sense of, you know, two people facing off against each other lock in a lock 
locked in together and a win-lose battle, you know, one is going to win, one's going to lose. The fight in mind here is an athletic contest where the energetic striving for the prize at the end involves straining every muscle, every tendon to the very end, training constantly to do that. And it's a very noble contest, one in which every true Christian is to be engaged. Paul stood in the foremost rank, but Timothy and all of us in Christ are with him. I think our verses might be better translated as, I have struggled the good struggle. This is the high calling of God to everyone in Christ Jesus. It's a, it's a lifelong struggle of every Christian it, and it's a struggle fought by what the grace of God has achieved in our hearts. When Paul got saved, when he first met the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing Jesus told him was Acts 9 verse 6, he said, Rise, enter the city, and you will be told what to do. And Jesus revealed himself to Paul and Paul was so overwhelmed that he never even thought to ask, Lord, what will you have me do for others? Or what will you have others do for me? He didn't even think of that. He was silent, he was blind, he was dumbstruck. But the Lord took Paul and he put him on a course. A very straight course. And Paul stayed on it. God said to Paul, I want you to be the apostle to the, Gent to the Gentiles. And when Paul looked back on his life, he could say, well, I finished the race. Well, I wonder if you know what God's will is for your life. You know, people are told these days everywhere that we're to have goals. If you haven't got goals or KPIs and whatever else you get in business and so on, we need to set ourselves a five-year plan or some such thing. And, and we're often told as Christians that if we don't have a plan and a goal and a purpose as a Christian, then we'd better find one and get it. And look, I know what people mean by that. It's to say that we should have some idea of how we're going to use the gifts that God gave us in service to him. But there really is only one goal and one plan for every one of us, one purpose for all of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ as our saviour. It is that we are called to fight the good fight. And there is no higher calling than that. We're to stay true to the course that God has set for us, run the race as hard and as true as we can, remaining faithful to him. The Christian life is not about being happy. It's not about achieving security and comfort and luxury. We all want those things, but it's not about that. The Christian life isn't about being happy despite what all the prosperity preachers teach us. The Christian life is there as Paul demonstrates it to us. He was possibly just days away from being put to death for his open, passionate love for the Lord Jesus. And he looks back and he says, this is what the Christian life consists of. To fight the good fight of faith. To be a spiritual warrior, to stay on course, to run it without veering to the left or the right, to run the race, to be faithful, to be true, not to yourself. How often do we hear that? Be true to yourself. No, don't be true to yourself. Be true to the way that the Lord is. And, and you know, all of us, we know this, that how clever the devil is in this. The devil doesn't primarily get us to go and say, oh, stop, go back. He doesn't do that. He doesn't try to turn us around. He's too clever for that. He just simply tries to get us to veer off the track a bit. He's tried, I can tell you, honestly, he has tried to track, sidetrack me in my ministry all right, right through it to get me off on something else rather than the thing that God called me to do. Get me into the focus on psychology and counselling. Get me to get off fighting against the marriage laws that we've got in our country. Get me off fighting the racial and religious vilification act by used to, that's you being used to shut down our freedom of speech today. 
get me fighting the onslaught of what is still in our public schools, the Safe Schools Program, which promotes homosexuality, which teaches our children to obliterate gender distinctions under the guise of fighting and bullying. And so we have that big farce in the Olympics at the moment of two men fighting girls, women. But God called me to preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus and our Saviour. I'm not saying these other things are wrong causes and I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm going to pay my respects to counselling all the way. Every time I, I get a chance, I'm going to say what I can against racial prejudice and vilification. I'm going to speak up for the work and freedom of speech in this country. I'm going to say that the Olympic opening ceremony was an absolute shocker when the Lord's Supper was portrayed in the way it was. It was a blasphemy against God. I'm going to speak for the freedom of religion in this country and freedom of speech. I'm going to present what the Bible teaches on those things, on abortion and marriage and homosexuality and respect for women and moral purity. But none of those things are actually the point. It's just so easy to get sidetracked into these things. And how easy it would be for us as a church to get sidetracked from the course that our Lord has actually given us. Paul could look back and he says, I have fought the good fight, I have run the race. And like him, as it says in Hebrews chapter 12, we are to lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Nobody stays on course who doesn't keep their eye on the goal. And the goal is Jesus. And so when Paul says here, I've kept the faith, he's saying... He didn't deny the word of God. He didn't deny the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ over all of his life. He preached the whole counsel of God. William Booth, you may recognise him as the founder of the Salvation Army, and he said once, the chief danger of the 20th century, so this is going back a bit, but he said the chief danger of the 20th century, no less true in the 21st that we live in today, he said would be, Religion without the Holy Ghost, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, and heaven without hell. And he's right. Because in most pulpits across this nation, that's what you're going to hear. And today, if any of us take a stand for the word of God and we don't vary and we keep the faith, we will be accused of being narrow-minded and bigoted. Well, so be it. We will keep the faith. We believe what God tells us. There is only one way to heaven. And there is only, that way is only through Jesus Christ. We believe that sin is sin. That homosexuality is wrong, that adultery is wrong, that drunkenness is wrong, that stealing is wrong. And we say so and we're not going to back off from it. And if that happens to be called narrow-minded and intolerant, and it's not, by the way, then that's what God wants us to be. People who accuse genuine Christians who follow the word of God of that sort of thing, just simply don't know what it means to love your neighbour as yourself. And the second best, the second most blessed, the most mightiest gift to the world of today, after the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, sacrificed on the cross, is the pattern of life which he presented to us in his word, which he provided as the, to this world as the most healthy, fruitful, happy, caring way to be together as people. Paul not only looks back and review in our verses here, but he, the second thing he does is he, he comes to a place where he lets go of this life. Verse 6, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure 
has come. Now that word departure, I don't know if you got it in your version, but the word departure there literally means release. It's about untying and Paul is saying the time of my release is at hand. In, in, in scripture when someone was a prisoner and they were let out of prison, when they were set free, that same word for departure was used there. The farmer when he unyoked his ox at the end of the day of ploughing the field, that's the word that was used. He released, he set free his oxen. When a soldier was out in the battlefield, he was ready to go home from the battle. It was time for him to take up the tent pegs when the battle was over and he was going home. That was the word that was used. Or when a sailor, sailor let the ropes go from being tied to the wharf or they weighed anchor and set sail out of the harbour to arrive in another harbour, they used the same word, departure, release, as that ship was released and being set free when a philosopher had some really deep problem and he just couldn't unravel it when finally he came to an answer, whether it was real or not, I don't know, but when you know, he came to some sort of insight when the truth was unravelled before him, that's the word he used, he was released. And here we've got Paul saying, I can see myself getting out of prison and going to glory. He could see the burden of life and the sin-filled place being lifted off his shoulders and he's saying, I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm about to set sail for another glorious harbour and soon I'll understand the great mysteries that have puzzled me so, for so long. I remember Professor Zorn at the RTC, if you know, can remember him, but he would teach us and say, you know, we'd be, he'd teach us systematic theology doctrine and he would say, this is a really hard thing to understand. Now, Professor Zorn, he was a, you know, he had a great mind. But he would say to us, when I get to heaven, I really want to sit down with Paul and say, now, what did you mean just here? I don't get it. Because that's what we're going to do. I really believe that. We'll spend eternity discovering new things that we have yet to see. Paul was there for a departure and he was ready for it. Third thing we notice here about Paul as he came to the end of his life and he looked back, he's seen the hand of God over every part of his life at every point and he's at peace. But look at how he looks to the future. Look at verse 8. He says, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. He's getting ready to go to heaven. Paul and a great, great many others in Christ Jesus have run their race. Ours is still to go on. How are you struggling? For the good struggle of living for Jesus. How are you doing that? How are you running the race of the Christian life? Well, Paul could say that he trained for it. He trained like an athlete as he ran the race. He, he kept his eye always on the finishing post. For him, for him, there was nothing less than the glory of God by the means of the salvation of sinners. And this was his one holy passion. Everything was concentrated on living life as well and as fully and as closely as he could to the will and the purpose of God. The light of the glory and the knowledge of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ that he received. He lived for that. Was he perfect? No, he wasn't. He only became perfect when he entered into glory. But that was his fight. It should be ours. And I hear the Apostle Paul saying to us here in our verse, in faith things, I've fought hard, I've run well, but I've also been sustained to the end by the deeply rooted conviction that at the end, because of Christ my Saviour, I will receive the prize, a glorious crown of righteousness. So let's never, any of us, ever be content to simply let life kind of pass us by I know life slows down as we get older, but respond to the call of God to turn in faith to him and live that faith every day. Amen. Let's bow together in prayer. 
Almighty God, thank you, Father, that we can open your word and we hear these great things about your great people. And yet, Father, the really great thing is that we see you, that we hear about you, that we hear about what the Lord Jesus Christ really did, that we hear about the blessing of the Holy Spirit opening our hearts and making it possible for us to see and to hear. Father, please guide and direct our thoughts and our desires through every menial and every difficult thing that we have, the small and the great, to see where this is leading us, to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, grant that we too may fight the good fight and be true everywhere at all times. In Jesus' name. Amen.